We are continuing in our series on Luke, and I want to begin by kind of reviewing where we are in the story. And what happened is there's this couple, Zachariah and Elizabeth, and they are older and past the age when normally a couple could have children. And they have never been able to have children. And Zechariah uh, was a priest. And the Bible says that they were righteous people. They were good people. And he was a priest. And he had a torn that usually only comes once in a lifetime for a priest to go and offer the incense in the temple. And while he was doing this, an angel, in fact, the angel Gabriel, came to him and told him that God was going to do a miracle and that Elizabeth was going to have a baby in her old age. And Zechariah, even though he's a righteous person, a good man, he doubted that this could be possible. And uh, so the angel said, well, I stand in the presence of God, and since you didn't believe this message I'm telling you, it's still going to come true, but you won't be able to talk until it comes true. So he comes out of the temple, and he can't talk, uh, but he makes signs, and uh, so eventually he goes home, and Elizabeth does get pregnant, and uh, then Mary comes and visits her, uh, and Mary's also pregnant, but Elizabeth is quite a bit farther along, and Mary leaves, it seems like, right before John the Baptist is born, and that's where we're going to pick up the story this morning, and um, there's kind of two parts to the story here, and the first part that we're going to look at is John's birth. John the Baptist, his birth, and then there's this naming ceremony that goes along with his birth at the time for him to be circumcised on the eighth day. And we're going to look at that, and then we're going to begin to look at this part in yellow, which is uh, after uh, he's named, Zachariah is able to speak again, and he gives this beautiful, wonderful, powerful uh, prophecy. Now, I was going through this and making points. And there were so many points, I saw it wasn't all going to fit in one sermon. And uh, so we're going to begin going through Zechariah's prophecy this morning. But Lord willing, we'll look more at Zechariah's prophecy next week. So we're going to read this passage now. And I'm going to read it from the Bible while Hope uh, flips through the screen. So you can either follow in your Bible or up on the screen either way. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out, what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe, and throughout the hell country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David, as he said through the holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant that he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, 
to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will speak to us through your word this morning uh, about John the Baptist, but also about your great mercy and about Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Well, we're going to begin by looking at uh, this part of the story about John's birth. And it says, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. And the main point I get out of this is very simply that God keeps his promises. Uh, God had told uh, Elizabeth that she was going to have a baby. Well, actually, he told Zechariah, and then Zechariah <laughs> told Elizabeth. And what God said comes true. And this happens both in individual lives, God's individual promise to Zechariah and to Elizabeth, but also in this uh, part of Scripture, we see that God's promises through the ages about saving his people, those promises also come true. And you can trust God that all the promises he has given us in the Bible, he's also going to keep all of those promises. He is a promise-keeping God. Then in the next verse we read, her, relatives, uh, her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. It turns out that mercy is a significant theme of this passage we're looking at this morning, both the story of John's birth and the prophecy that goes along with it. And because this is a, a, a significant part of the passage, uh, I want to take some time, and God kind of put it on my heart, to take some time to kind of camp out on this topic of mercy. Now, the, now the reason I know that this is a significant uh, topic in this passage is, well, you can obviously see it right here as, as soon as I highlight it. Uh, this topic of mercy shows up three times in the passage. Uh, we just read that God showed Elizabeth great mercy, and then during the prophecy, Zechariah mentions it twice. He says that God shows mercy, and he, and he talks about the tender mercy of our God. So the basic point is that our God is a God of great mercy. But what does that mean? Let's, let's think about it a little bit more and spend some time trying to get this truth clear in our minds and, and, and understanding it and feeling it because it's important. Um, this word tender mercy here, uh, it comes from two Greek words, blotna allows. The second word is just the, the word that's normally translated mercy. The first word, splatna, it, it literally, the most literal meaning was the inside parts of a person's stomach. So your bowels or your intestines. Now that's not what it's being used to mean here. Just like if I tell Hope, honey, I love you with all my heart, I'm not talking about the physical organ that's beating blood. I'm talking about uh, with all of my feelings and all of my life. And, um, and, he, and the Greeks used this word splotna to talk about if you felt something really deeply down in your gut. Now, you know, sometimes you feel something and you feel it in your chest, but sometimes you kind of feel it in your gut. And this is where they got this word from, so the word originally, and it still could be used literally to mean uh, your guts, but uh, it came to mean uh, often compassion. And what it's saying is that God has this type of compassionate mercy. And it's important that we don't think of God as being cold and emotionless. Uh, it's not like he's a computer and he calculates how much mercy you need. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Mickey's had a stressful week. He's had 15 points of stress. Let's give him 15 points of mercy. It's not cold and calculating like that. God cares and he feels. Now, you might wonder, can great God up there really feel compassion for us and have this emotional response? He, he can and he does. And... Uh, we can relate to this. This is an analogy that's far from perfect, but even if we see an animal suffering, 
sometimes we feel compassion for that animal. Now, we are much more valuable than an animal, and God has compassion on us. And not only that, remember that God the Son became one of us. So if God feels compassion for us. Uh, sometimes people say he feels our pain, and that's become kind of a trite saying. But in God's case, he really does feel compassion for the difficult things in our life, and this deep feeling of compassion leads to merciful action. And then thinking about what does the word mercy itself mean, um, a really good definition I found is uh, in a book by Wayne Grudem. Now, he, Grudem has wrote a lot of books. Uh, here I'm referring to his, probably his most famous book, which is this big, thick blue book called Systematic Theology. And uh, if you think systematic theology is boring, uh, you should read Grudem's book and you'll find out it's not. There are some systematic theologies that are boring, but Grudem's is not. And uh, it is uh, really just filled with insight and biblical truth. And uh, he has chapters on the attributes of God. And one of the attributes is mercy. And he came up with this definition. And I'm pretty sure the way he did it, it was by looking at lots of examples throughout the Bible that talked about God showing mercy. And I also looked at lot of, lots of examples. And when I saw his definition, I was like, he got it. He nailed it. So God's mercy means God's goodness toward those in misery and distress. God's mercy means God's goodness towards those in misery and distress. Now, God's mercy applies to both immediate, personal, private needs in each one of our individual lives and also to universal, deep needs that the whole human race has. It works on all these different levels. So, for instance, in this story, um, there was a very personal, uh, distressing situation for Zechariah and for Elizabeth. And the situation was that they wanted children, and they didn't have children, and it seemed like they wouldn't be able to. And God had mercy on her, the story says, by blessing her with a child in a miraculous way beyond the age when you could normally have children. But then this mercy also applies to our great deep uh, need for salvation. God sees that we have blown it. Uh, we've sinned against him. We've rebelled. We cannot save ourselves. He could have let us go our, our own way to destruction, but he intervenes. He sees us in our miserable, helpless condition, and he intervenes with mercy, bringing us uh, salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, thinking about God's mercy and his help, uh, I was thinking that we want to really apply this, but I was thinking, who would it apply to? And I thought maybe it'd be better to say, who doesn't need God's mercy today? So I was thinking, if there's anybody here, and there are no difficult situations in your life, if nothing painful is going on in your life or in the lives of people you care about, because that also affects us, um, if there's nothing causing you stress, uh, if, there's, if there's no situation that you wish you could change but you can't change, then you might not need this mercy thing. The rest of us need it, <laughs> including me, and uh, I'm pretty sure that's going to include all of us. Um, we all need God's mercy. Now, I was thinking, and God just put this on my heart to do this. Um, I don't want to just talk about this. I want to apply this. And all throughout the Bible, God's the one showing mercy, but we do have a part to play. Uh, God is pleased when we call out to him and ask for mercy. And in fact, if you look up, uh, if you get a concordance or you can do this on a computer, you will see that over and over and over and over and over and over again throughout the Bible, and there's a whole huge pile of examples in Psalms, people are praying to God basically this prayer, have mercy on me, my God, have mercy on me. And then they fill in the details. These enemies are attacking me. I've sinned and I'm under judgment. I need forgiveness. Uh, uh, you know, I I'm sick and I need healing. But the basic prayer is, God, have mercy on me. I'm in a difficult, painful, stressful situation. I need your help, Lord. Have mercy on me. And I wanna, we're not at the end of the sermon yet, but I want to stop right in the middle of the sermon. And uh, I want to just have a, a minute or so of silent prayer uh, 
well, I don't care if you choose to pray out loud, but that's not what I'm asking you to do. Uh, and I just want to have a minute or so, and everyone can begin this prayer like this, God have mercy on me, and then you fill in. There's, there's probably a lot of situations. I know a minute or two isn't going to be enough for you to mention all the situations, but something on your heart where you want to cry out for mercy, and I don't think there's anyone who doesn't need it, but if you, do, if you feel, if nothing comes to mind, you just pray for the person next to you or the person uh, up here in front because we all need a lot of God's mercy. So let's just take a minute and be quiet and pray. Heavenly Father, I know that every one of us here does feel a deep need for your mercy. And Lord, some of those stories and problems, I know at least part of them, but there's a lot I don't know. But you know, you see, you care, you have compassion, and we thank you that you invite us to call out to you, our merciful God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I am so glad that we have a merciful God who cares about the situations in our life. Now, not only is God merciful, I, before we finish the topic of mercy, I want to point out one more thing. Uh, five chapters down the road in Luke, uh, Jesus says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. And we remember that God's big plan for us is for us to become just like Jesus. And we know that we're not going to be like Jesus in every single way. For instance, people worship Jesus and people aren't supposed to worship you. But in many other ways, we are supposed to be like Jesus. And one of the ways in which we are supposed to be like Jesus is we are supposed to be merciful to other people. So God is showing us mercy, and we also want to feel compassion and do what we can for other people who need our help and show God's mercy as he shows mercy to us. Now, getting back to the story of uh, John the Baptist being born, it says, the Lord showed her great mercy, and they shared her joy. And it's my hope and my prayer that some of you will experience uh, answers to this cry for mercy that you just made. And maybe in the next week or two, you might share it with me and, 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 and with your permission. If it's something private, I wouldn't share it without your permission. But uh, with your permission, if you wanted to share it yourself or if it was okay for me to share it so that we can share each other's joy as God answers our cry for mercy, the way that Elizabeth's relatives and neighbors were sharing her joy when God showed mercy to her. Continuing in the story, it says, On the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father Zachariah, which apparently was fairly normal. Uh, today, sometimes people are named after their parents, you know, uh, Bob Jr. or whatever. Uh, uh, but his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. And in case you forgot, uh, the, uh, uh, Gabriel had said what his name was supposed to be. And apparently, Zachariah had passed this information on to Elizabeth using that writing tablet, probably. Um, they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. They weren't so sure that Elizabeth was getting it right, so they checked with Zechariah. Uh, so Zechariah asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. And uh, it's very emphatic, the way he writes it. Uh, in fact, it could be translated, John is his name. And uh, he's not saying that he wants the name of John. Gabriel had came to him, and Gabriel had said, this child is to be named John. And uh, so Zechariah is saying, 
Uh, it's not up to us. God already decided his name is John, so that's what his name is. And, uh, and then immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. And uh, just like the angel Gabriel had said, he had this time when he couldn't speak, but as soon as the prophecy was fulfilled that, that Gabriel gave, um, which included the fact that he would be named John, his, Zechariah was able to speak again. And I learned something from this. And one thing I learned is that even people who are already righteous and serving God, like Zechariah, can grow in trusting God more fully. In other words, Zechariah had doubted when the angel first gave him the message, but he had learned to trust more deeply and more fully. Now, he had this, this discipline when he couldn't speak for nine months, which also would have limited what he could do in terms of serving, but God's purpose in that discipline wasn't to do any long-term harm to him at all. In fact, uh, God wasn't trying to keep him from serving. God was getting, ready, getting him ready to serve in an even bigger way. When God does discipline us for a while, he's preparing us for future service. And that's exactly what happens because uh, the next verse says, His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. And now, now Zechariah is going to give this big prophecy. Now, there's a lot in this prophecy. I'm going to kind of draw out one main point, maybe look at some other things a little bit, but one main point this week, and then next, uh, next week we'll look at it some more. But here's the prophecy, and the prophecy is basically about a mighty king who saves. Now, that might not be obvious, a horn of salvation. In English, it doesn't jump out to us what that means. First of all, there's this problem with, in English, the word horn can have two meanings. It can mean, you know, something you blow, like that, you know. Or, uh, or it can mean the kind of horn that's on an animal. Well, this is the kind of horn that's on an animal, okay? And uh, why are they talking about that? Well, animals with horns, they, they thought about oxen and bulls, and uh, these are big, strong animals. Uh, in fact, you can go on YouTube and see videos of uh, wild oxen out in Africa throwing lions around up in the air with their horns. Uh, these are strong animals. Now, if a whole bunch of lions gang up on them at once, mm, that's a different story. But uh, when, when the lion fights the ox, the lion does not always win because the, these ox are really strong. And so these people back then knew that, so horn became a symbol of strength and might and power. And then... Uh, it got further, it eventually became a symbol, and it's used this way clearly in the Bible often, to refer to a mighty, powerful ruler, a mighty, powerful king. So anybody who is used to uh, thinking like this would immediately see a horn of salvation, or that means a mighty king who saves. And uh, once you know what the symbol means, it's obvious that it means a mighty king who saves. Now... That's what the prophecy is about. And the prophecy is not something that's brand new with Zechariah. Zechariah's prophecy is based on other prophecies. Zechariah said that what he's saying is something that was said by the holy prophets of long ago. And he names two of them. He names uh, David and Abraham. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've already mentioned this a number of times over the last few weeks, that there were these prophecies given all throughout the Old Testament pointing forward to Jesus. And for instance, there was a prophecy given to David uh, that he would have a descendant who would reign on his throne over a glorious kingdom forever and ever. And then there was uh, prophecies and promises given to Abraham that one of his seeds would be a blessing to all the nations. Uh, but those aren't the only prophets. Uh, in fact, all of the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus, pointing to Jesus, beginning way back in the first chapters of Genesis. Uh, the, the first obvious prophecy about Jesus is when God tells Eve that she'll have a descendant who one day will crush the serpent's head. And then all the way through the Old Testament for centuries, there's prophecies pointing to Jesus. Now, who is Zechariah's prophecy about? Well, we've already given it away, but let me point out that this is a little bit strange. 
this prophecy appears to be given at the naming ceremony of his own son, John. Wouldn't you expect the prophecy to mostly be about John the Baptist? But it's not mostly about John the Baptist. If you look at the prophecy in detail, you will see that it begins with this long section that's focused on Jesus, who, by the way, isn't born yet, but Zechariah knows he's coming. Uh, he knows it prophetically because he's filled with the Holy Spirit, but also uh, Mary had come and spent time with them. And, and they knew that she was going to be the mother of their Lord. Uh, Elizabeth had said so prophetically. So he's focused on Jesus in this first part of the prophecy. <clears throat> then he does talk about the role that his own son is going to play for a couple of verses. Then he gets back to Jesus again. And uh, now we might think, uh, well, boy, John doesn't seem very important. Um, but not only that, even the part that's about John is really about Jesus. Let's look at it. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. So in the one section where he talks directly about his son, he's saying what his son is going to do, and what his son is going to do is point everybody to Jesus. So, so this is all about Jesus, and yet, John the Baptist is really great. And, uh, and we know that John the Baptist is really great because, well, to begin with, Gabriel said he was going to be really great. Uh, Gabriel, speaking about John the Baptist, said he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Now, having Gabriel say that your kid's going to turn out great, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. And yet there's something more amazing, and a more amazing statement of John the Baptist's greatness. And how can anything get more amazing than Gabriel? But remember this, Gabriel is only a servant. He's a servant of the King of Kings, of the Lord, just like you and I are. And the King of Kings himself says something about John the Baptist. This is what Jesus said. I tell you, among those born of women, that's kind of a poetic way of saying everybody. I mean, do you know anybody not born of women? <laughs> um, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. What makes John great is his closeness to Jesus. You see, in, Jesus is saying, in a way, uh, John the Baptist is greater than Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible. He's greater than David, who's the most famous king of Israel. He's greater than Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these other big prophets. Uh, Jesus is saying, he's the greatest. Well, all these other prophets pointed forward to Jesus. John the Baptist has the incredible privilege. Jesus is standing next to him in the river. Uh, John the Baptist baptizes him, and then the heavenly dove comes down, and John the Baptist says, this is him, the Messiah. It's not me, it's him. This is him, the Messiah, the Christ. He's the one. So it's the closeness to Jesus and the privilege of pointing out Jesus that makes John the Baptist so great. And that helps us to understand this next statement, which is mind-blowing and unbelievable and not anything I would ever think of to say if it wasn't in the Bible. Uh, yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. In other words... Not in every way, but in some true way, you are greater than John the Baptist. Jesus said so. There is a sense, if you're saved, if you're born again, then you're in the kingdom of God, you're greater than John. How could that be true? Well, this is how it's true. Remember, John the Baptist was great because he was pointing people to Jesus and because he was close to Jesus. But John the Baptist didn't know as much about Jesus as you know. He didn't know about Jesus being crucified and rising again and giving the Great Commission and sending the Holy Spirit. He may have had hints of that, but he did not know that clearly. You do know it clearly. And you can point people to Jesus even more fully than John the Baptist could. 
just like John the Baptist was able to point people to Jesus more fully than Isaiah and Moses and Abraham could. Not only that, but there was a sense in which Jesus is closer to you than he was to John the Baptist. Because we have the Holy Spirit in us in a way that people did not have until Jesus had died, risen, and ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. So here's what I get from all this. The great thing about you is not you. I hope, that, you know, that doesn't... Dip. The great thing about you is not you. The great thing about you is your relationship with Jesus. And that makes me feel good because it doesn't depend on me being smart or succeeding or, uh, you know, how much people like my sermon each week or whether you have a big crop or a small crop or whether your team wins or loses or how big a deal you get. It doesn't depend on any of that stuff. You know, it depends on Jesus. When we're close to Jesus, that's where we get this, this sense of meaning and purpose. And again, I wouldn't say this, but it's in the Bible. It makes us great in a way. It makes us great in a way, being close to Jesus. Now, this isn't just true about you. Colossians 1.16 is talking about Jesus, and it says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. In other words, I was walking with Sadie early this morning. It was early enough that we could still see some stars up in the sky. Every one of those stars was created for Jesus, to give him glory. Every blade of grass that you walk over is created for Jesus. Every butterfly that flutters by was created to give Jesus glory. Now, Jesus is loving beyond um, uh, understanding, and he's glad to share his creation with us. So it's okay if you enjoy the butterfly that was created for Jesus, but ultimately, it was created mostly, primarily, first of all, for Jesus, just like you and me. And when we are doing what God made us to do, that's where we find the most joy and peace and meaning in our life. And I love this statement that John Piper came up with. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Uh, and so uh, it's a great thing that we are supposed to be all about Jesus. And uh, so... Thinking about this truth, that Jesus is what counts, and thinking about God being merciful and trying to tie it all together, uh, this is how we can kind of conclude things this morning. And we'll talk more about this prophecy next week, because there's a lot more in there. So our lives and everything that exists are all about Jesus. And, and this is true for everybody. In fact, if a person didn't believe in Jesus, the most important thing about them is that they don't believe in Jesus. The most important thing about everybody is Jesus. And uh, uh, so uh, we're all about Jesus. And because Jesus is full of compassionate mercy, it's a good thing that the whole universe is about him because he uses it all for the good of us who love him. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and that you sent Jesus because of your mercy. And we thank you that you made us for Jesus and that that gives our little lives down here meaning and purpose and even glory and greatness. Lord, help us to stay close to Jesus and to reflect you more fully and to fulfill the purpose you have for us more completely and also help us to experience your mercy and give us reason uh, to share reports of joy that we can share with one another in the coming weeks. We pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.